I realized I didn't put the mic on. Can you hear me okay? I figured that. <laughs> well, again, it's a joy to be back with you. I enjoyed being with you this morning. Tonight, what I'm really hoping to do is talk about faith and what you do with your faith. So we're going to be looking at a story, more of a, of a Bible study tonight. Um, but if you'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. A familiar story probably to you that has to do with someone named Elijah. No. But let's, let's have a word of prayer before we go any farther. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word and what we can learn from it. But help us not simply to be hearers of your word, but doers. That will take what we hear and, and apply it to our lives. Then in hope, one, we can draw closer to you, but two, we can draw others to you. That will be a living word. That people will be able to see the faith that we have. And be challenged to have that faith in you as well. That's what we'll be looking at here tonight. But may your word go forth and accomplish all that you wanted to do as we listen to you most of all. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But 1 Kings chapter 17 is, we're going to actually be looking at 17 and 18, but it's really about the story of Elijah. And it's real interesting because you're about to see some things in his faith that you're probably going to go, well, I never do that. <laughs> and yet, what the book of James tells us is that he's got a like nature like us. Which is just a nice way of saying it. It's not any spectacular faith that he has. It's the same type of faith that you and me can have. But look at verses 1 through, through 7 first. And Elijah the Tishbites of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, and turn eastward, and hide by the book brook Sherith, with flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Sometimes within scripture you're introduced to a character and they'll give you a little bit of background about them. Elijah, this is the first time he is mentioned in scripture. Doesn't tell you a whole lot, does it? It tells you he's a Tishbite. That's a fancy way of saying he's from a small town called Tishbe. You probably have never been there and I never heard of it before, right? Who goes to Tishbe? I have no idea. Oh, tells you it's in Gilead. It's a part of Israel. But he stands up to the king and says it's not going to rain till God says so. So let's at least go back a little bit more and explain something here because this is crucial understanding his faith. By Bible scholars, if you were to ask who is the most wicked king in Israel, they're going to tell you Ahab. And his wife is Jezebel. And combined, they are a wicked, anti-God pair. They are somebody who kill the prophets of God. They have no interest in God, and they support a God called Baal. In fact, we'll read later on, Jezebel is feeding 450 prophets of Baal. Tells you how much she likes them, huh? But can you imagine this if you are Elijah 
And you're being told by God, I want you to go give a bad message to King Ahab. Is it going to cross your mind, will he kill me? It would take faith, wouldn't it? Wow. On top of that, the message. It's not going to rain until God says so. And, and, and we know from different passages in Scripture, it's going to be three and a half years. And if you willing to do that? Or would you sit back and wonder, I wonder if it's going to rain tomorrow or next week? Um, if God told you to go to our president and say it's not going to rain in the United States until God says so. What an act of faith. Wow. Really is something that tells you so much. And again, he has such a faith in God and his faith. Again, he's a nature just like ours. So understand something about faith. It's not that we need more faith. Nowhere in scripture are you commanded to get more faith. In fact, at one time, in Luke chapter 17, you don't have to turn there, but the disciples come to him and they go, Lord, increase our faith. And instead of going, no, no, don't do that, he gives them the story. If you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. How big's a mustard seed? It's one of the smallest seeds that's out there. So it... It doesn't take a gigantic faith to be able to do things. With Peter, he walks upon the water. And when he gets in the boat, he's commended, Oh, you of little faith. Imagine what you can do with little faith. Someone has widely said, and I hope I can say this right, because sometimes I get it wrong. It's not the greatness of our faith in God that moves mountains. It's our faith in the greatness of God that moves mountains. That becomes the difference. Now, do you have faith? Everybody has faith. The big question is, where, what, and who are you placing your faith? Because I can give two prime examples. You have a science book that you probably read years ago. You probably still hear it. Do you actually see air? You breathe it, right? Did you question it when you read that in a science book? Did you go, I wonder if there really is air? Or did you just accept it by faith? Nobody at least walked in here and began I said, going to question, I wonder if there's air in here. You probably don't do that anywhere, right? You just by faith accept that. Same with the chair you're sitting in. And if you come in and check it out to make sure... It's pretty stable. Uh, now, with that kind of faith, is it, is it also include prior experience that lets you know? Well, if I sat in it this morning, it should help. It should work this afternoon, right? But it's still a faith that says, I didn't look to see if it support as well. You use faith so often. And what's so interesting, we'll take a science book and for the most part believe everything it says, and yet there's so many people that doubt the Word of God. No other book has had so much written about it. But faith is so important with the life of God. Because you've got to have faith. If not, you're not putting your faith in the God, you're putting your faith in something that you already reasoned out yourself. And that's why faith talks about it, it is the evidence of things not seen. Oh, God doesn't want you to know everything. Because if you did, you wouldn't be trusting him. You'd be trusting what you know. So with Elijah, I'll tell you, that is some faith just to walk up to the king and just trust in God. He's not going to kill me. He's killed other prophets. And I got a message he's not going to like. And then it's not going to rain. But there's actually a third one in here of faith. And I bet you didn't have this happen to you. 
Did you ever have a raven feed you morning and evening for many, many days? Now, if I said if a bird fed you, you could say, well, I had chicken, right? No, we're not even talking that type of bird, right? That's the type of bird that you're feeding on, not that the bird brought you the food, right? And you read for this little detail? To the Jew, ravens are unclean animals. And on top of that, our great people who study birds have found out that ravens, if they have too much food, will hide it. But they hide it in cow dung. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm seeing this raven bringing my food, it's probably going to cross my mind, where has he recently been? <laughs> what does this food really smell like? I mean, he did it by faith. Every morning, every evening. Wow! That is a faith. And he doesn't question it. Because like, I, I imagine, though, and this is also a part of faith that says, once you start to act on that faith, can you use it to build and strengthen the faith you have? And the answer is yes, because I think after that first day, he's going to go, I want for the coming back tomorrow. But what do you think he's thinking after a week? I know God's going to do it. I mean, it started out with faith, but then it's just that, that confidence that if God said it, he's going to do it. But God doesn't just have us take our faith and use it for ourselves. Because we look at the rest of this chapter in chapter 18, we're going to find out that Elijah inspired the faith of others. Because what's going to happen next? That last part I read said, and the brook dried up. He needs water. There's a famine starting over the land. Water's becoming scarce. And he says, or God tells him, I want you to go to a place in Zidon. And I want you to go to a town called Zarephath. And there's a widow there who's going to provide for you. This is where I look at this and I think, doesn't God have a sense of humor as well? And I say that because in the meantime, it's been months, maybe even a couple years. King Ahab, Queen Jezebel want Elijah dead. They have sent people across Israel. Find him. Bring him back. Kill him if you need to. They have contacted other nations and said, Is Elijah staying there? I say all that because in 1 Kings 16, going back one few verses really, look at verse 31. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sin to Jeroboam. It's talking about Ahab there. The son of Naboth, that he took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbiel, king of the Sidonians. What a place to hide Elijah in the birthplace of Jezebel. <laughs> Who would have thought to look there? That's why I mean, God knew exactly what to do. They're probably thinking that's the last place he would go, right? Why would he go to the place where Jezebel was from? It could only be worse for him. And God knew exactly what to do. But look at verse, verse 10. Going back to 17. So Elijah rose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. 
only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar, and see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. At first it almost sounds like Elijah's just being very cold. She just told him, I'm going to die. The severe has been so bad for her, she figures I've got enough to make really, got a little bit of flour, a little of oil, going to build a fire, cook it, basically make a little biscuit, and that's all we have left for me and my son. And it's not that he's being cold. He is challenging her. She starts off with the first thing that she says, and it says so much, as the Lord your God lives. She may be living in a foreign country, but she does have some faith in Lord God Jehovah. And so what Elijah is doing is challenge her. This is my challenge. If you have faith in God, listen to what I'm going to tell you God's going to do. Make that cake, bring it to me first. Then go back. And can you imagine to her surprise when she went back and she made two more? She didn't think there would be enough for two more. And she looked back in that bin and there's, there's still flour. There's still oil. But wait a minute, it should be empty. Oh my goodness, her faith was challenged and she responded with that. And that's where Elijah is going to stay for a long time. His faith challenged her faith. And she responded by saying, I am going to put my faith in your God. Now a little bit later, her son's going to die. And she's going to feel so remorseful. And, and the first thing she's going to say to Elijah is, why, why has my sin caught up with me? But that's just a fancy way of saying God's convicting her heart. You still have some sin to confess. But Elijah's going to bring that son back to life. Wow. His faith is real. We get to chapter 18. We read about someone named Obadiah. And not the Obadiah that wrote the one book in the Old Testament. Obadiah, it's a different one. Usually that book, the only thing it's noted for is being the shortest book in, in the Old Testament. <laughs> this Obadiah lives in the palace with Ahab and Jezebel. But he is faithful to God. And what Elijah is going to do, he's about to meet Obadiah. Because the king's going to say to Obadiah, because at this point it's been about three and a half years, I want Elijah found. I want water sources found. And so they both go their separate way, and Elijah catches up with Obadiah. Look down at verse 9, chapter 18. This is Obadiah speaking here first. How have I sinned that you're delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said he's not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab he cannot find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, 
have feared the Lord from my youth. Was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread or water. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here. He will kill me. <laughs> Let me just stop there. He's got faith. There's no doubt about that. And he's actually doing things for God. This is another case where I think God has a sense of humor. He lives in the palace. Jezebel and Ahab are feeding 450 prophets. Do you think they miss the meats and bread that Obadiah is taking and giving to the 100 prophets of Israel? I think it's kind of funny if they think they're filling only their prophets and don't realize they're giving the best to God's prophets. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? But Obadiah is showing a lack of faith here, and understandable. I'm sure he has heard about so many people coming back to King Ahab and going, We found Elijah. And by the time they get to that spot, he's not there. And of course we know he also was never there. He's been inside him. People are making up story because I'm sure the king offered a nice ransom. But he never was found. And so with Obadiah, he's got a moment here of a lack of faith. I'm not going to do it. How do I know you're going to be here? When Ahab comes... Elijah, being the prophet, says, I give you my word. I will be here. Obadiah leaves. His faith has been strengthened. Got two people now their faith has been strengthened. Ahab comes, and the first thing he says, if you look down at verse 17, he said, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Nah, it's not him. It's Ahab. And that's actually what he says in verse 18. I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather to Israel, to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. And that's exactly what Ahab does. In his mind, he's thinking, let's see, 450 and 400 more, 850 to 1. We got this guy wrapped up. Don't ever do that with God. One plus God is a majority. You're on the right side. He will take care of you. But Ahab, his faith is not in God. His faith is in Baal. So the next day what's going to happen is you're going to have those 850 prophets show up. You're going to have Israel show up. They've been at a point wondering, we've been told for a long time to put your faith in God. And now the king's saying put his faith in Baal and Asherah. Who should we listen to? So they show up because they heard there's going to be this confrontation. And what Elijah does is put forth a very simple one that says this. We each will build an altar to our God. We each will put wood on that altar. We each will take an animal sacrifice and put it on that altar. But no one is going to bring fire. We want the God who is true to answer by fire. And so... Elijah being, being polite says, you hundred and eight hundred and fifty, you get to go first. And it says from morning till noon, they cried out to their God. And at that point, Elijah has a little bit of fun with them. Could you say he's mocking them? Yeah. Maybe your God's asleep. Oh, he's on vacation. That's what it is. Probably, he's hard of hearing, right? Do it louder. 
And all that did was just make him more mad. It says they began to cut themselves and began to scream louder and dance around. And about the time for the evening sacrifice, it was probably between 3 and 4 in the afternoon, after they've had probably about 6, 7 hours and accomplished nothing, Elijah Morley says, my turn. Look down at verse, verse 30. Then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two sails of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and it also filled the trench with water. Let me just stop there. Tells you a lot about Baal when the altar has been torn down. But he rebuilds it. He does put the wood on. He does put the bull after cutting it. And it says he built a trench big enough to hold two saya. That's about four gallons. And then he turns to the people, and this is where he's going to challenge their faith. Fill these four pots of water. Water is scarce. What would you do if you're thinking, I may only have one pot of water for the rest of the week? Where am I going to find extra water? How long is this drought going to last? And where do you find water on top of a mountain? You're going to have to walk down that mountain and walk back up. Do you really want to do it if you're not sure? But he challenged their faith. And they walked down and they filled the four pitchers. And of all things, he dumped it on the sacrifice. Go fill it again. Go fill it again. Four pitchers of water. I mean, I, I, I picture this wood and this sacrifice more or less floating in water. Now, if you know anything about camping and building a fire... How easy is it to even light wood that's damp, much less soaked in water? Oh my goodness. But he's really testing their faith. And, and they do it. Because they really want to find out, where should my faith be placed? Should it be in Baal? Which, by the way, is a God who's known for being the God of nature, who handles the rain. And he hasn't been able to do anything for three and a half years. But oh my goodness, the people's faith have been challenged. And they respond. And then he does a very short prayer. Look at verse 30, verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said... Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust 
and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Wow! What they couldn't do in six, seven hours, he did probably in about 30 minutes. Maybe a little bit longer. It could take count time for them to go down the hill and get the water, right? But either way, he wasn't doing much. Just wait for them to come back. And his prayer was short, but so powerful. Lord, that they may know your God. And when you think about what fire this sent down, some of it makes sense, but some of it's, you could argue this truly is a miracle. Wood being burned up, no problem. The sacrifice being burned up, no problem. How easy is to burn up stones? You can't, but God can. The stone and the dust, it would be like looking and there's nothing there left. It's completely gone. Wow, their faith now has been strengthened. So Elijah's done it for a widow. He's done it for Obadiah. He's done it for the people. There's still one more person, though. His faith is going to challenge. And that's going to be his servant. Because they're on top of a mountain, and he says to his servant, I want you to go over to that cliff and come back and tell me what you see. Hmm. And if you look at verse 43, and he says, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And seven times he said, do it again. Would you be tempted after time six to sit down and go, I'm not doing that again. Six times I've gone there and I haven't seen anything. Why am I going again? I'll just sit here for a few moments and then I'll tell them that I did it, right? Would you be tempted to do that? I'll admit I would. I'm not going to expect to see something. How many times do I have to do this? But that seven time. Oh, look at verse 44. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot, go down before the rain stop you. Now it happened in the meantime, the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. A cloud as small as a man's head. That's pretty small, isn't it? But by the time he gets back to Elijah, the sky is black. Go tell Ahab to get down off of this mountain. I can only imagine how muddy of a road it was for a chariot. And what's even interesting... Did you notice the last verse? Elijah is on foot and now runs the chariot back to Jezreel. God's been working with him, hasn't he? So there's this another one. The faith has been challenged. So as I begin to pull all this together, number one, I said, you have a faith. The only question is, what are you putting your faith in or whom are you putting your faith in? That's really the key. Can you put your faith in multiple things? Sure. But the most important person you put your faith in is God. There's no other way around that. And again, it's not based upon what you can do. It's based upon His Word. It's based upon God on terms of who He is. Because that's really what you're doing. We don't always understand everything God is doing. But when we do put our faith in Him, He's going to use us in ways we probably never dreamed of. So are you taking your faith and using it to strengthen others? Let me close with at least two stories. One of them is funny, and the other one's a very serious one. But I'll do the funny one first. There was an elderly lady, lived all alone. Everybody kept telling her, you are so weak. How do we even walk around? What are you going to do if somebody comes in and tries to steal you, steal your house? 
And she responded, my faith is in God. It's not going to waver. Well, when shortly afterwards, when she was asleep, she heard a burglar. Turned on the lights in the living room, and there he was with a knife in his hand and a sack with things he had already put in there from her house. And her response, she yelled, Acts 238! The guy looked at him, dropped the knife, dropped the bag, and put up his hands. She called the police. Came back, and they're asking her about what happened, and, and they go, why did you say Acts 2.38? She, she said, it was the first thing that popped in my mind. And they turned around and asked the burglar, why did you drop the knife then when she said 2.38? I thought she said she had an axe and 2.38s. God protected her, didn't he? Amen. <laughs> the other one is a true story also. It's based upon someone named Henry Ford. Henry Ford, not the one that did the, the cars. From, this one lived in Chicago, not Detroit. he really been praying for God to use him in a way he never dreamed. One day on his way to work, he just felt God was telling him, I want you to go to the airport and I will guide you. Don't question it. He called his boss and said, something has come up. Don't ask me what, but I will not be in work today. He gets to the airport and he hears about a flight number to Miami. And God said, get on that flight. He goes down, there is one seed left. He gets on it. And during the whole flight, he tries to talk to the guy beside him, but he didn't want to talk at all. But he kept praying, God, what are you doing? Have your way with me. I don't know what you're doing, but you have something up. He gets to the Miami airports. God says, I want you to get in the first taxi you see. And he does. Still wondering, what is God up to? And, of course, when the taxi driver asked him, where do you want to go? He said, just a moment. I need to pray about this. <laughs> and God said, take him to the harbor. So he goes down to the harbor. He gets out. Okay, God, now what do you want me to do? There's a fishing boat. It takes tourists out. They go out there for several hours. I want you to get on it. And his first thought was, God, I've never fished in my life. But that's what you want. I'll do it. He gets on that boat. They're out in the middle of the Atlantic, at least as far as he's concerned, far from land. And still praying, God, I still want you to use me. It wasn't that long he looked over and saw this guy that was crying. And he walked over and talked to him. And the guy has given him a sad story. More or less, he's planning on committing suicide. And the guy said, I'll tell you. I don't know what to do. People tell me about God. I don't even know if there is a God. So what I've been praying all day is this. God, if you are real, send someone named Henry Ford to me. Because if it doesn't happen, I'm jumping off this boat. Wow. And of course the person looked in and said, I'm Henry Ford. Wow. Started off in Chicago. Wow. Faith can take you to places you never dreamed of. And that's not necessarily bad, but yeah, are we apprehensive about it at times? Absolutely. But the more you end up doing things like that is when you find out how much God is using you in ways you never dreamed of. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Because we live in a world in which there is so many looking, so many searching, so many who claim to be a Christian, and I'm not getting into whether they are or are not, but they need, some of us just need their faith strengthened. Some of it, they never really placed their faith in Christ. But as the old saying goes, we are the only Bible some people ever read. 
And the only way they're going to find out about God is through us. In the life that we live, the word that we share. That's my challenge for you tonight. Go forth this week. Use you however you dreamed. Because I'm living proof of that right now. I never thought coming to Pen Pen from Pennsylvania down here would I be preaching at Lake Seminole Baptist Church? Probably never crossed my mind back in Pennsylvania. But you never know how God's going to use you. Be open to the opportunities he has. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you do want to use us. And yes, we are sinners. There's no doubt about that. But we're also sinners saved by grace. And yes, we do make mistakes, but you forgive us and still want to use us. Thank you that we have the opportunity to put a faith in you that is real. And I promise you're not going to let us down. You're always with us and want to continue to use us. So I just pray for these here. May you use them this week. However you see fit, maybe more what you want, more than what they want. And may we respond with, yes, Lord, yes. Have your way with us. Because it's not our will, but your will that needs to be done. So thank you for the way you're going to use us this week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.